So parables invite us in. They're sparse, usually short little stories that um, aren't willing to elaborate a whole lot. And they invite us to do the wondering and the pondering and the imagining, turning them this way and that, layering them over our own lives and looking through them to see ourselves differently. They, they kind of invite us to use our spiritual imaginations. They invite us to find our way in. So here is this dear pious man who has come to the temple. And we stand beside him. And when we overhear his loud praying, we have to wonder, who is he speaking to really? You wonder, is he actually praying to God? And as you stand there, you wonder, does God require this volume? Could God not hear a more civil tone? Or maybe his volume, maybe his insistence suggests something else. Who is he trying to convince? Is he hoping that you'll hear him? That you'll be impressed? Or do you catch maybe he's got one eye open and kind of looking over that way? Yeah, now he stands a little straighter when he sees that the Pharisees heard him, or the tax collector, rather, has heard him. You know, he's kept his distance. He's kept his distance from people like that, the people who can't get it right. He's standing over here with us, the folks who are, are careful at maintaining good order and being nice and doing things correctly. He's kept his distance, but his voice does carry now, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, he knows he's been heard. Maybe that's why he's speaking loudly. Who is he really speaking to? How often has he run through his lists, you wonder, as you stand there? They do roll off his tongue pretty naturally, like he's practiced in front of a mirror, maybe. The reasons why he's really a pretty decent guy, that he's got plenty to be proud of. That list of folks he's glad not to be. Frankly, those sound a little familiar to you standing next to him because you've got your own list too, right? Lists of why you belong in this section over here of pious, respectable folk. The internal math we do to, to be sure that, you know, a, a consistent record of niceness that's got to outweigh the selfishness maybe or the short temper that flares. But it's only when that one person Right? That only that one person gets our short temper. Yeah, his lists do sound a little familiar. And now that we're thinking about uh, that one person who gets our short temper, no, 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 they're nobody, right? But still, that feeling makes you wonder about our, our friend praying here. What does he see when he sees that tax collector? The volume, the tone of his voice in, in a place of prayer that's so uncalled for. Where did that come from? None of us love the system, you might think, but singling him out, that's got to be more than just the general frustration. The disgust in his voice at this small cog in a big machine. Why? It sounds personal. You start to wonder, does he know this sellout? Is it a cousin? Brother-in-law? He's got to live with this guy, doesn't he? He's got to put up with his choice to be reminded again and again as he turns down invitations to this tax collector's nice dinners. So as he stays home and eats simply and alone, He's got to remember again and again that he had that choice, right? He has to deal with this all day, every day, part of his family. He doesn't belong here at the temple pretending to care about God. I know him better than that. He doesn't even promise to do better next time. He just shows up begging for mercy. Again, it's like he grows a conscience monthly. He makes a scene with his crying and his beating his breast like a, the women do. He's 
still wearing the clothes that were bought with other people's money. <laughs> makes sense. You wouldn't want to be connected with him in public either, would you? It makes sense that this fellow would pray a little louder. Make sure God knows. Make sure everyone knows that this crud of a brother-in-law knows it makes sense that he would pray a little louder, repeating those things again so he remembers himself that he is not like those people, not like him, and certainly does not envy him, does not wonder in the night what it would be like if he had taken him up on the offer of a job. It makes sense that he would pray a little louder to be sure that God knows that he shares God's contempt for sinners like that. And that's where Jesus hooks us, isn't it? There Jesus has us. His parable doing that work of delivering us right to the heart of things. Contempt. It comes naturally, doesn't it? It's so easy to compare ourselves to other people. And it's so easy to feel good when they're bad, right? And then the next step is easy, too. It's so easy to assign that to God. The Psalms are full of it. Honest prayers of God's people saying, Look, God, I hate the people you hate. I hate them with an unending fire. God rejects injustice. So surely God's stomach turns at the sight of folks who are unjust. Surely God's laughing in disbelief at this schmuck over here begging for mercy who has not even demonstrated his willingness to walk away from wickedness. Surely his pleas are getting sort of divine side eye. God, you're not listening to him, are you? We're so good at deciding for God. We are so good at assigning to God the contempt that we feel for the people we feel it for. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man, this man, this tax collector, went to his home justified rather than the other. It turns out that throwing yourself on God's mercy is always the right move. It's always the only move. God is not in the business of contempt. God is in the business of grace and mercy. If God were in the contempt business, well, that Pharisee and that tax collector would be standing together with me and with you and with all of this world falling so far short of the glory of God, way off at a distance. And Jesus says that's not how it works. God comes in the flesh to that world, way off in a distance, in Jesus, because God is not about contempt. God speaks grace and mercy. The truth that our parable this morning invites us into is that we are not as glorious as we'd like to pretend to be. And that we are not as hopeless as we sometimes suspect we might be in the eyes of God. Grace and mercy. And if we find ourselves leaning into contempt, then we can be pretty sure we've stopped trusting grace and mercy, and we've started trusting whatever it is that makes us different from the person that we are looking down upon. And there's as many things, as many idols there as there are individuals. But always, God does not speak contempt. God speaks grace and mercy even for puffed-up folks like us. 